Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Victoria Memorial Hall for this evening's lecture on Mahatma Gandhi and the Partition of India by Professor Shugata Bose, Guardian of Professor, Harvard University. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Jointa Shangupto, Secretary and Curator of Victoria Memorial Hall, to kindly welcome the audience and introduce the speaker for this evening. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's lecture on Mahatma Gandhi and the partition of India. And it's a huge privilege and honor, as always, to have with us this evening, to give this lecture, Professor Shugato Bose, one of the foremost historians of our time. As you know, we have been celebrating the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi with various programs. In July, we did an exhibition called Reliving the Ideals of the Mahatma Through Art, featuring the representations of Gandhi in folk art. Last week, we have started a nine-week long program called Revisiting Gandhi Through Films, featuring weekly film screenings each Wednesday in this hall. Today, we have the first lecture event in our year-long engagement with Gandhi. And it is very apt that we have somebody like Professor Shugato Bosch to do this for us. He, of course, doesn't need any introduction to this audience, but as the host of this event, it is my duty to say a few things about him. So I will make a very preliminary effort to do so. <clears throat> Professor Shugato Bosch is the Gardiner Professor of History at Harvard University, where he has also served as the Director of Graduate Studies in History and as the founding director of Harvard's South Asia Institute. Prior to taking up the Gardner Chair at Harvard in 2001, Professor Bose was a fellow at St. Catherine's College, University of Cambridge, and Professor of History and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Educated at Presidency College, Calcutta, and the University of Cambridge, where he obtained his PhD, Professor Bose has contributed through his scholarship to a deeper understanding of colonial and post-colonial political economy, the relation between rural and urban domains, inter-regional arenas of travel, trade, and imagination across the Indian Ocean, and Indian ethical discourses, political philosophy, and economic thought. His many books include Agrarian Bengal, Economy, Social Structure, and Politics, published by the Cambridge University Press in 1986, South Asia and World Capitalism, which came out in 1990. Peasant Labor and Colonial Capital, which was published in the New Cambridge History of India series in 1993. Credit, Markets and the Agrarian Economy of Colonial India in 1994. A Hundred Horizons, the Indian Ocean in the Age of Global Empire, published by Harvard University Press in 2006. Modern South Asia, History, Culture, Political Economy co-authored with Aisha Jalal, and whose third edition came out from London and New York by Routledge in 2011, and which is uh, a widely used survey text used in universities all over the world. And I had the pleasure of teaching from that book when I was teaching in the United States. Uh, His Majesty's opponent, Shohas Chandra Bose and India's Struggle Against Empire, uh, published by the Belknap Press of Harvard University and by Alan Lane and Penguin in 2011, and The Nation as Mother and Other Visions of Nationhood, published by Penguin in 2017, as well as many other edited volumes of essays. A recipient of the prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in 1997, he has also served as chair of the Presidency Mentor Group, advising on the rejuvenation of Presidency University as a world-class center of excellence and as a member of the governing board of Nalanda University. From 2014 to 2019, he served as the member of parliament from the Jadapur Lok Sabha constituency in Kolkata. And I'm sure many of us in this hall have been privileged to listen to his speeches in the parliament. Professor Bose is currently writing a book titled Asia After Europe, Decline and Rise of a Continent, which is contracted with the Harvard University Press. And he's also working as general editor on the series called The Cambridge History of the Indian Ocean. Professor Bose, for those uh, who don't know, 
Professor Bose has directed three documentary films on India during the Second World War, on Netaji Shuhas Chandra Bose, and on the threats posed by communalism and caste conflict to Indian democracy. Professor Shugato Bose is also an accomplished singer and has two compact discs on Rabindra Sangeet, titled Amar Rabindranath and Adhar Ambore, and one on patriotic songs titled Amar Desh. And that's all I have to say. Uh, like all of you, I'm looking forward eagerly to a lecture on Mahatma Gandhi and the partition. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Shugato Bose to speak on Mahatma Gandhi and the partition of India. Uh, before Professor Shukatabo takes the microphone, uh, may I request uh, Jointo Shangrupto to kindly hand over a memento on behalf of Victoria Memorial Hall to Professor Bose. Um, Professor Bose is going to speak on the uh, Mahatma Gandhi and the partition of India, but whenever we organize a lecture here, we see that at every lecture, there is a partition within the audience. Partition in the form of those whose mobile phones do not ring and those whose mobile phones ring during the lecture. We do not want this kind of partition, definitely. So if you could kindly put your mobile phones on silent mode or put them off totally till the end of the lecture, we'll be very grateful. And over to Professor Bose. Thank you, Jayanto, uh, for a generous uh, introduction. And thank you, Mr. Raman, for all your organizational efforts. I was last uh, in Savarmati Ashram to speak uh, on Gandhiji on the 16th of August. And that was a truly moving experience. But as you will see, you know, Gandhiji was very much uh, based in Bengal in the last few years of his life. So I'm very glad to be able to speak on this particular uh, subject before a Calcutta audience. My dear Sharut, Mahatma Gandhi wrote from Hardwar on June 21st, 1947, to Shubhash's elder brother. I have a moment to myself here. I use it for writing two or three overdue letters. This is one to acknowledge yours of the 14th instant. The way to work for unity, I have pointed out, when the geographical is broken. Hoping you are all well, love, Bapu. You can see that letter on the right-hand side of the screen with Bapu's signature at the bottom. Mountbatten's partition plan, announced on June 3rd, had shattered Gandhi's lifelong dream of a united and independent India. He did not agree with the Congress Working Committee's decision to accept it. He had done his best to get people to stand by the cabinet mission plan for a federal India, but had failed. He confessed on June 8th that he had been taken to task for supporting Sharat Bose's scheme for a united sovereign Bengal, while acknowledging that Sharat was undoubtedly his friend and they were in correspondence with each other. His erstwhile lieutenants now considered him a back number. He asserted on June 11th that he was, quote, as much of Pakistan as of Hindustan, unquote. Having stated his difference with Congress leaders, he nevertheless asked the All India Congress Committee at its meeting on June 14th and 15th to swallow the unpalatable decision to partition. The AICC did by 153 votes to 29. Even at the moment of his biggest political defeat, the indefatigable Mahatma would neither cede the moral high ground nor stop showing the way to work for unity. Already on June 6th, he urged the Union of India and Pakistan to vie with each other in doing well. On June 12th, he wondered if the readjustment of the geography of India meant two nations. He admitted that the territorial division made the challenge of unity difficult. Yet he urged the soon-to-be citizens of free India to rise to the occasion, and by their character and bravery, incorruptibility and toleration, 
prove to the Muslims of Pakistan that in the Union, there is no discrimination whatsoever on the ground of religion, caste, or color. And the only test is merit, which every industrious citizen of the Union will have ample opportunity to acquire. The real unity of India depended on whether the shrines of Islam and Muslim seats of learning were honored equally with the others, and Hindustani, a compatible mixture of Hindi and Urdu, had a future. The partition of 1947 was not a tragedy foretold. As World War II drew to a close in 1945, efforts were underway to share power equitably once the British quit India. Even though the Gandhi Jinnah talks of September 1944 had failed to achieve a breakthrough, the leaders of the Congress and the Muslim League in the Central Legislative Assembly, Bhulabhai Desai and Liaquat Ali Khan, produced a formula in early 1945 for their respective parties to have an equal number of seats, 40% each, in an interim government. The Simla Conference of June 1945 founded on Jinnah's insistence that the League should be allowed to nominate all the Muslim representatives. Gandhiji drew an important distinction between religious communities and political parties. You will quite con unconsciously but equally surely, he wrote to Wavell, defeat the purpose of the conference if parity between caste Hindus and Muslims is unalterable. Parity between the Congress and the League is understandable. The Congress was at this stage demoralized. Its leaders, recently released from detention, unsure about how to rekindle the freedom struggle that had been ruthlessly suppressed in 1942. At such a moment of uncertainty, the Indian National Army appeared before the country and the Indian National Co Congress as a godsend. In September 1945, the AICC resolved that it would be a tragedy if these officers, men and women, were punished for the offense of having labored, however mistakenly, for the freedom of India. The Congress formed a defense committee led by Bhulabhai Desai and Tej Bahadur Sapru and invited other parties to join it. Once the trial began at the Red Fort of Saigal, Dhilan, and Shah Nawaz in November 1945, political parties and religious communities united in a popular movement against the hubris of the British Raj. It was during the height of the Red Fort trial that Mahatma Gandhi forged a new intimate relationship with Bengal and began the process of acquiring his Bengali identity. He came in December to Shodhpur. On the 17th of December in the afternoon, he visited Sharad Chandra Bose and his family at One Woodburn Park. He then went to call on Bashanti Devi, the widow of Deshabundhu Chittaranjan Das. And then at 8 p.m. in the evening, he paid homage to his rebellious son Shubhash in the bedroom of the Elgin Road home from where he had made his great escape in 1941. <clears throat> on 18th December, he left for Tagore's abode of peace. True monuments to the great, he declared in Shantiniketan, are not statues of marble or bronze or gold. The best monument is to adorn and enlarge their legacy. Of course, these days, we build huge statues. I remember when the Iron Man of India was being cast in iron, I told my friend Arun Jaitley in Parliament that the Sardar would probably been happier if the money had been allocated for agriculture and rural development. Gandhiji was in Medinipur on January 3rd, 1946, when the news came that the Red Fort Three, who had been sentenced to deportation for life on 31st of December, had been released. These Hindu, Muslim, and Sikh soldiers of freedom came from Punjab. But the INA had undermined the British separation of martial and non-martial races 
and had large numbers of Tamils in its ranks. Gandhiji urged INA soldiers he met in Madras to follow the lead of the Congress. On February 10th, 1946, he decided to revive his journal, Harijan, after a gap of three and a half years. One of his first articles, published on February 12th, addressed the question of unity. Netaji's name, Gandhi wrote, is one to conjure with. His patriotism is second to none. His bravery shines through all his actions. He aimed high but failed, but who has not failed? Ours is to aim high and to aim well. The lesson that Netaji and his army brings to us is one of self-sacrifice, unity, irrespective of class and community, and discipline. Netaji, Gandhi told military men who came to visit him in Uruli Kanchan in March 1946, had, quote, rendered a signal service to India by giving the Indian soldier a new vision and a new ideal, unquote. Way back during the non-cooperation movement, after Jallianwala Bagh, Gandhiji had said that the Indian soldier was being used as a hired assassin. And now they had a national ideal before them. The Mahatma initially harbored a hope that Netaji would return to join him in the work for unity. But on March 30th, 1946, Gandhiji explained in an article written for the Harijan his earlier feeling that Netaji could not leave us until his dreams of Swaraj had been fulfilled. To lend strength to this feeling, he added, was the knowledge of Netaji's great ability to hoodwink his enemies and even the world for the sake of his cherished goal. His instinct had suggested to him that Netaji was alive. He now could no longer rely on, quote, such unsupported feeling, unquote as there was, quote, strong evidence to counteract the feeling, unquote. In the face of these proofs, the Mahatma wrote, I appeal to everyone to forget what I have said and believing in the evidence before them to reconcile themselves to the fact that Netaji has left us. All man's ingenuity is as nothing before the might of the one God. He alone is truth and nothing else stands. The ideal of unity that Netaji had instilled in his followers remained alive. On his return to Delhi in early April 1946, Gandhiji visited INA prisoners in the Kabul lines and the Red Fort. He was told that they had never felt any distinction of creed or religion in the INA. But here, we are faced with Hindu tea and Muslim tea, they complained. Why do you suffer it, Gandhi asked. No, we don't, they said. We mix Hindu tea and Muslim tea exactly half and half and then serve. The same with food. That is very good, explained, exclaimed Gandhiji, laughing. At the height of the non-cooperation and Khilafat movement in the early 1920s, Gandhiji had not dined together with even his closest political comrades, Shaukat and Muhammad Ali. Eating, he had said, was one of the privately performed sanitary practices of life, and the Ali brothers were indulgent of his bigotry, if his self-denial could be so named. On the matter of interdining, he had happily changed with the times. He was nostalgic about the euphoria of the common struggle a quarter of a century ago. The Ali brothers and I used to go all over the country together like blood brothers, he recalled on April 6, 1946. We spoke with one voice and we delivered the message of Hindu-Muslim unity and Swaraj to the masses. The climax of the joint movement had been reached in Delhi, where Swami Sraddhanand addressed a gigantic gathering of Hindus and Muslims in the Jama Masjid. It was a glorious day in India's history, Gandhi declared, the memory of which we shall always treasure. Gandhiji knew that the Muslim masses, by and large, had not been as enthused by his civil disobedience and quit India movements of the early 1930s and 1942, 
certainly not outside the Northwest Frontier Province. The remembrance of the early 1920s Satyagraha and the example of the INA became recurring features of his discourses on unity. The Mahatma was in Delhi to hold talks with the cabinet mission that had recently arrived in India. By the spring of 1946, the British had reckoned that their hold on India was no longer tenable. The issue was now not whether the British could be forced to quit, but rather how power was to be distributed among the communities and regions upon the British withdrawal. Gandhiji's relevance to the Congress as a leader of mass movements diminished as soon as it was clear that the colonial masters had read the writing on the wall and were making up their mind to depart. However, he had not yet been completely elbowed aside. He was present at Simla in early May during the tripartite talks among the British, the Congress, and the League to try and reach a constitutional settlement. You have achieved a complete unity among the Hindus, Muslims, Parsis, Christians, Anglo-Indians, and Sikhs in your ranks, Gandhiji told 60 senior INA officers who came to see him in Simla. That was no mean achievement outside India, and he urged them to keep that spirit of unity alive under Indian conditions. But then the talks between the Congress and the League broke down on May 12th, 1946. The cabinet mission was then left with no option but to issue a statement on May 16th based on the lowest common denominator of the Congress and League positions, proposing a three-tiered federal constitutional structure based on three groups of provinces. Gandhi had suggested to Cripps on May 8th that grouping was really worse than Pakistan. Yet, after a careful perusal of the May 16th statement, he rose above the usual nationalist suspicion of British perfidy to give a more measured opinion on May 20th. It was, according to him, the best document the British could have produced under the circumstances. The possible infringement of provincial autonomy by the groups posed a problem. For example, could the Northwest Frontier Province be bundled into Group B, dominated by Punjab, or Assam into Group C, against their will? In Gandhi's interpretations, the provinces were free to join groups on terms attractive to them and were not being ordered to do so. His message to those worried by the grouping and arbitrary assignment to groups was that there was not the slightest cause for perturbation. Grouping of provinces in the Muslim majority sections B and C was of the essence for the All India Muslim League, which had given up the demand for a fully sovereign Pakistan on that assurance. Even though both the Congress and the League formally accepted the cabinet mission proposal in June, Jawaharlal Nehru's statement on July 11th, after taking over from Maulana Azad as Congress president, that grouping may not last, unnerved the League. With Jinnah calling for direct action to achieve the League's demand for Pakistan, Calcutta exploded in violence on August 16, 1946, and sporadic killings gripped Bombay in September. When will this orgy of madness end? Gandhiji asked in anguish on his 77th birthday on October 2nd, 1946. Killings in Calcutta and stabbings in Dhaka, Agra, Ahmedabad, and Bombay. Tego's song, Jibon Jakhon Shukai Jai, Kuruna Dharai Esho, had never sounded more poignant. When life is parched up, come with a shower of mercy. Days later, in an article titled Hindu Pani and Muslim Pani, Gandhi wrote, a stranger traveling in Indian trains may well have a painful shock when he hears at railway stations for the first time in his life ridiculous sounds about Pani, tea, and the like being either Hindu or Muslim. Even as late as September 1946, Gandhi had believed that violence was lodged 
in the hearts of a handful of townspeople, and that as a villager, he was one with the ocean of Indian humanity. The eruption of violence in the rural backwaters of Noakhali in the second week of October 1946 came as a rude shock, ensuring that the Bengal countryside became the venue of one of his most challenging experiments with truth. Noakhali and neighboring Kumilla were Muslim majority districts in the vortice of an economic crisis marked by sluggish jute prices and skyrocketing food prices. Credit relations between mostly Hindu moneylender landlords and Muslim peasants were in a state of disrepair, and Hindu traders were hated for their callous role in the famine of 1943. Demobilized ex-servicemen supplied an additional volatile element in a tense setting. Ghulam Sarwar, a former MLA who had lost to the Muslim League candidate in the recent provincial elections, led the attacks in quasi-military fashion against a vulnerable Hindu minority. Unlike earlier agrarian disturbances of the Depression decade, there were murders, abductions of women, and forced conversions on a large scale. Even before Gandhi could reach Noakhali, terrible violence was unleashed on the Muslim minority in Bihar. Is it nationalism, Gandhi asked in indignation, to seek barbarously to crush the 14% of the Muslims in Bihar? He did not, however, interrupt his journey to Noakhali. The apostle of nonviolence was destined to follow the trail of violence putting out the embers after the fires had done their destruction and supplying a healing touch to those who had been singed by its flames. On his arrival in East Bengal, Gandhiji fondly remembered his first visit to this region in the company of the Ali brothers during the non-cooperation movement. This time he had come not as a congressman, but as a servant of God. He told the beleaguered Hindu minority that the Muslims were blood of our blood and bone of our bone. He sought complete identification with the Bengali people. I claim to be an Indian, he asserted, and therefore a Bengali, even as I am a Gujarati. Once he settled down to live in the village of Srirampur from November 20th, 1946, he diligently took lessons in learning Bengali before the crack of dawn. He explained why he had made himself a Bengali. Bengal had produced not just Tagore and Bonkim, but also, as he put it, the heroes of the Chittagong Armory Raid, however misguided their action might have been in my eyes. He could not understand how there could be cowardice in a province with that lineage. Bengal might still solve the problem facing all of India. Based in remote Noakhali, Gandhiji consistently argued in favor of provincial rights. He admitted that Shubhash Bose had been right in contending in 1939 that Assam was a special case and that the Gopinath Bardoloi ministry should not resign along with the other provincial governments. We look to the Congress, Gandhi pointed out, and then we feel that if we do not follow it slavishly, something will go wrong with it. I have said that not only a province, but even an individual can rebel against the Congress and by doing so, save it. The Mahatma had come a long way from imposing the discipline of the high command on provincial units. It was incumbent, he felt, on the Congress and the League to make their policy appeal to the reason of the recalcitrant province or groups. Between January 7th and March 2nd, 1947, Mahatma Gandhi undertook a 116-mile pilgrimage on foot through 47 villages of Noakhali and Tipera. Manu Gandhi sang his favorite hymn, Vaishnava Janato, at the early morning prayers on the day he set out on his journey. At Bapu's suggestion, the word Vaishnava would be occasionally replaced with Muslim and Isahi during the singing of the chorus lines. In addition to bringing solace to those who had suffered, Gandhi candidly held forth on burning social and political questions of the day. 
On January 20th, he reached the village of Shirundi, where Amtus Salam was on the 24th day of her fast for the cause of Hindu-Muslim unity. He extracted a written pledge from Muslim leaders to maintain peace in the locality before advising her to break the fast with a sip of orange juice and to the chant of Quranic verses. The cause of communal riots, he bluntly said, was the idiocy of both the communities. 5,000 people gathered to hear him on January 22nd at Paniala, which had hosted an intercommunal dinner a few weeks ago. At Dalta, on January 23rd, the Chaudhuris of the village gifted him the plot on which his prayer meeting was held. He was glad that on the auspicious birthday of Netaji Shubhashchandra Bose, he had received this gift and had the privilege of staying at the home of a scheduled caste friend, Rai Mohan Mali. He reminded his audience that, that Netaji was an Indian first and last, and that he fired all under him with the same zeal so that they forgot in his presence all distinctions and acted as one man. Shubhash had, in his life, verified the saying of Tulsidas that all becomes right for the brave. The next day at Muraim, Gandhi stayed in the house of Habibullah Patwari and addressed the largest gathering of his tour. In Komolapur, in Tipera, on February 21st, Gandhiji was asked point blank whether he, who had been advocating inter-caste marriages, also favored inter-religious marriages. He honestly answered that there was a time when he had not done so, but had quite a while ago decided that an inter-regional marriage was a welcome event whenever it took place. It had to be based on mutual friendship, either party having equal respect for the religion of the other. Gandhiji devoted the month of March 1947, serving those who had suffered grievously in Bihar. As he moved from Bengal to Bihar, he disdainfully declined an urgent invitation to attend a Congress Working Committee meeting in Delhi, saying that was not within his present beat. On his arrival in Patna on March 5th, he stated categorically that what the Hindus of Bihar had done to the Muslims was infinitely worse than the horrors in Noakhali. Accompanied by Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, he visited ruined Muslim homes and asked Hindus to atone for their sins in the land of Tulsidas's Ramcharitmanas. No sooner than Gandhi had started to restore some calm in Bihar that news came of the violence that had engulfed Punjab. On Christmas Eve 1946, a few young men sat sipping hot tea at a crowded table in the Lorangs at Lahore. The crowded road, the thronged restaurant, the rippling laughter of pretty women in prettier clothes, B.R. Nanda recorded, this was the customary life of the gay town of Lahore. He chatted with a Muslim friend about the great Calcutta killing, the Noakhali tragedy, and the Bihar frenzy, and they expressed satisfaction that their own province continued to be at peace. The Punjabi character, his friend claimed, was averse to the kind of hatred that had appeared to have taken root in eastern India. Nanda made an accurate forecast that the tranquility would last only as long as the Khizar Hayat Khan coalition government managed to stay in office. In the eyewitness account he wrote in December 1947, titled Punjab Uprooted, he held Clement Attlee, or rather the Prime Minister's February 20th statement, to be immediately responsible for the outbreak of the Punjab disturbances in March 1947. It may have been more accurate to blame the responses of the Hindu Mahasabha, the Congress, the League, and the Akali Dal to Attlee's declaration that the British would quit by June 1948 at the latest. The Mahasabha was first off the mark, demanding the partition of Punjab and Bengal. Jawaharlal Nehru followed suit. The Khizar government fell on March 2nd. With Gandhiji away in Bihar, the Congress Working Committee passed a momentous resolution on March 8th, 1947, calling for the partition of Punjab. Nehru explained that the principle of partition 
might have to be extended to Bengal as well. At the very end of March, Gandhi eventually came to Delhi and met Mountbatten. On April 1st, he told the delegates to the Asian Relations Conference being held in the Purana Killa that he was in the capital as the Viceroy's prisoner and Nehru's prisoner. He lamented that Indians did not know how to maintain peace. Speaking at the concluding session the next day, he expressed his embarrassment at the shameful carnage unfolding before their very eyes and begged the visitors from abroad not to carry the memory of that carnage beyond the confines of India. Living among the Dalits of the city, Gandhiji preached the message of peace. His prayer services typically included Quranic verses along with excerpts from other religious scriptures. When one or two members of the audience objected to the recitation from the Quran, Gandhiji altogether refused to hold the prayers. He was prepared to die cheerfully with the name of Ram and Rahim on his lips. As a Sanatani Hindu, he claimed to be a Christian, a Buddhist, and a Muslim at the same time. Taking a stand against religious conservatives on all sides, he declared that he saw no reason why he should not read the Kalma, why he should not praise Allah, and why he should not acclaim the Muhammad as the prophet. At the level of high politics, Gandhiji broached the idea of letting Jinnah head the first government of free India to Mountbatten in the second week of April. Unable to persuade Nehru and Patel, he left for Bihar in mid-April. Before doing so, he signed with Jinnah this joint appeal that read as follows. We denounce for all time the use of force to achieve political ends, and we call upon the communities of India to whatever persuasion they may belong, not only to refrain from acts of violence and disorder, but also to avoid both in speech and writing any word which might be construed as an incitement to such acts. Gandhiji insisted that he had acted as a true Hindu in his efforts to befriend the Muslims. To his critics, he cited Iqbal's famous line, Mazhab nahi sikhata, aapas me bear rakna. In both Noakhali and Bihar, his motto was do or die. My nonviolence, he explained, bids me dedicate myself to the service of the minorities. It was that sense of mission that called him back from Bihar to Delhi at the end of April to take part in a Congress Working Committee meeting and in parleys with Mountbatten and Jinnah in the first week of May. I feel sure Gandhi wrote to Mountbatten on his departure from Delhi for Bihar on May 8th that the partition of Punjab and Bengal is wrong in every case. Non-partition of these provinces did not mean that the minorities there were to be neglected. Gandhiji informed the viceroy that he had spent a very pleasant two hours and three quarters with Qaeda Azam Jinnah on May 6th. They had disagreed on Pakistan, but Jinnah had been agreeably emphatic about his commitment to non-violence. Between May 9th and May 14th, 1947, in Shodhpur, Gandhiji explored the possibility of keeping Bengal united in a series of interviews with Sharat Chandra Bose, Abul Hashim, and Hussein Shaheed Suravarti. Gandhi told Hashim on May 10th that he had been trying to become a Bengali. His main reason for learning Bengali was to be able to read Tagore's poems in the original. When Hashim professed that Hindus and Muslims alike revered the poet, Gandhi responded, that the spirit of the Upanishads bound Tagore to the whole of Indian culture. What would Hashim have to say, he asked, if Bengal wished to enter into a voluntary association with the rest of India? On May 12th, Gandhi gave Suravardi an undertaking in writing that so long as the Muslim League leader showed sincerity and undertook preser to preserve Bengal for the Bengalis, Hindus and Muslims, the Mahatma was prepared to act as his honorary private secretary. Having heard that the plan for a united sovereign Bengal had received Gandhi's blessings, Shama Prashad Mukherjee rushed to Shodhpur on May 13th. Gandhi wanted Mukherjee to evaluate the scheme on its merits. An admission 
that Bengali Hindus and Bengali Muslims were one, Gandhi told the Mahasabha leader, would really be a severe blow against the two-nation theory of the League. Sharut Bose sent a detailed draft of the United Bengal plan to Gandhi on May 20th. Bapu responded from Patna on May 24th, suggesting that every act of government must carry with it the cooperation of at least two-thirds of the Hindu members in the executive and the legislature, and that there should be an admission that Bengal has a common culture and common mother tongue, Bengali. He promised to discuss the draft with the working committee and said he would telegraph or telephone if Sharath was needed in Delhi. The plan was refined. Further, in the light of Gandhi's comments and a final version sent to Mountbatten through the good offices of George Catlin, a British MP, uh, Shirley Williams' father, who was a guest of Sharad Bose at One Woodburn Park. On May 22nd, Patel asked Sharad Bose to take a united stand with the Congress leadership on the partition of Punjab and Bengal. Sharad Bose retorted on May 27th, saying, the united stand should be for a united Bengal and a united India. On May 28th, Mountbatten recorded two alternative broadcasts in London. Broadcast A was to be used if both Punjab and Bengal were to be partitioned, and broadcast B if it appeared probable that Bengal would remain unified under the auspices of a new coalition government. Once Mountbatten returned to India on May 30th, Nehru and Patel vetoed the Bengali exception, and so it was broadcast A that went on the air on June 3rd, 1947. At his prayer meetings between May 29th and June 2nd, Gandhi had maintained that if the Congress or the British went back on the letter and spirit of the cabinet missions paper of May 16th, 1946, it would be a breach of faith. When the Congress Working Committee met to ratify the June 3rd partition plan, Gandhi remonstrated with Nehru and Patel that they had not informed him of the partition scheme before committing themselves to it. With the exception of Mahatma Gandhi, Abdul Ghaffar Khan, Jayaprakash Narayan, and Ram Manohar Lohia, no one else spoke a word against partition at that meeting. Once, and of course, that led Gandhiji to lament that all his yes-men had now become his no-men. Once August 15, 1947, was set as the date for independence, Gandhiji expressed his desire to spend that day in Noakhali. He did, however, take a detour to Kashmir and Punjab in early August. At Srinagar, he made clear his view that the future of Kashmir, quote, should be decided by the will of the Kashmiris, unquote. On August 6th in Lahore, he told Congress workers that he was going to spend the rest of his life in East Bengal or West Punjab, or maybe the Northwest Frontier Province. Once he reached Bengal, he abandoned his plan of going to Noakhali on August 11th to work for the return of sanity to Calcutta, this premier city of India. On August 13th, he moved into a home in the Beleghata neighborhood of Calcutta in the company of Suravardi. To those who distrusted the Muslim League leader, he said that he had known Suravardi since the Faridpur political conference where Deshobandhu Chittaranjan Das had taken him in the era of non-cooperation. Ignoring the celebrations in New Delhi, Gandhi chose to spend Independence Day fasting and praying with those who were poor and obscure. The Information and Broadcasting Department of the Government of India asked him for a message. The father of our nation simply said that he had run dry. Peace and Kamaradari reigned in Calcutta on August 15, 1947. In an editorial titled Miracle or Accident on August 16, the first anniversary of the great Calcutta killing, Gandhiji narrated how Hindus were taken to masjids and Muslims to mandirs at the dawn of freedom, and both communities chanted Jai Hind in unison. It was neither miracle nor accident, but the willingness of human beings to dance to God's tune. 
We have drunk the poison of mutual hatred, Gandhi wrote, and so this nectar of fraternization tastes all the sweeter, and the sweetness should never wear out. B. R. Nanda was right when he wrote that peace came to Bengal on August 15th through the bowl of a beggar who begged from the citizens of Rayattorn, Calcutta for a little mutual forgiveness and goodwill. He wondered if Gandhi's presence in Lahore in mid-August might have saved Punjab. It was Eid on August 18, 1947. While Punjab descended into anarchy upon the announcement of Radcliffe's award the day before, Hindus and Muslims wished each other Eid Mubarak in Calcutta. On August 21st, Gandhi was happy to note that Indian and Pakistani flags were being flown side by side at his prayer meeting. During the non-cooperation movement, Gandhi and Shaukat Ali had chosen three national slogans, Allahu Akbar, Bande Mataram, and Hindu Musalman Ki Jai. Gandhi was delighted that the last cry was being revived. On August 23rd, he described Allahu Akbar as a soul-stirring religious cry that had a noble meaning and urged Hindus to utter the cry with their Muslim friends. Bande Mataram, according to Gandhi, was a purely political cry. He had explained in the early 20s that he preferred Bande Mataram to Bharat Mata Ki Jai because he said Bande Mataram would be a graceful recognition of the emotional and intellectual superiority of Bengal. So once again, he said, you know, Bande Mataram, there had been a controversy over the song, which had been resolved in 1937 by Tagore in consultation with Shubhash Chandra Bose and Jawaharlal uh, Nehru. But he also noted many Bengalis had sacrificed their lives with that cry on their lips. As Bande Mataram was sung at the prayer meeting on August 29th, 1947, everyone, Suravardi, other Muslims and Hindus on the stage and in the audience stood up to show their respect. Gandhiji alone remained seated because he said he believed standing up as a mark of respect for a national song was an unnecessary Western import and was not a requirement of Indian culture. Calcutta had a brief relapse into violence at the end of August and the beginning of September. It required a fast by the Mahatma from September 1st to 4th, 1947 to bring the errant Calcuttans into line. Can you fast against the Gundas? Raja Gopalachari had asked, seeking to dissuade Gandhi. It is we who make the Gundas, Gandhi had re replied. Having restored tranquility in Calcutta, he was ready to leave for Delhi en route what he thought would be a trip to Punjab on September 7th. He wrote his farewell message to Bengal in Bengali, as you can see in his own handwriting, Amar Jibani Amar Bani, my life is my message. On September 10th, Gandhi made a 40 mile tour of Delhi, which he said in a national broadcast, looked like a city of the dead. Two days later, he visited the Jama Masjid where 30,000 refugees had congregated and the Purana Killa that had been transformed from being the venue of an Asian international conference to a refugee camp of, for 50,000 helpless people. If India fails, Gandhi warned, Asia dies. The spirit of revenge and retaliation that vitiated the atmosphere in Delhi mortified him. B. R. Nanda had an insight into why it was so difficult to curb the post-partition lawlessness in Delhi and Punjab. Communal passion is a passing emotion, he noted astutely. The vested interest in property is more permanent. When the first wave of blind violence had passed in the West Punjab, the lure of loot was the chief motive of violence. Calculated homicide succeeded indiscriminate violence. It was no longer a fanatic's leap in the dark, but an adventurer's firm foothold on a house, a shop, or a factory. More recently, Ayesha Jalal has depicted partition violence in Punjab as not about religion as faith, but a scramble over zar, zameen, and zan, wealth, land, and women, 
in the region's patriarchal society amid the crumbling ruins of the British Raj. That is what made separating at close quarters a colossal human tragedy. Gandhiji had an inkling of what was really going on when he commented, irreligion masquerades as religion. This is happening even today. Irreligion masquerades as religion. After Pakistan and India went to war over Kashmir, Gandhiji reiterated that the people of Kashmir must decide their own future, quote, without any coercion or show of it from within or without, unquote. The Rajas and Maharajas of the princely states could at most serve as trustees. Whispers had reached his ears that Kashmir could be divided along religious lines with Jammu for the Hindus and the Valley for the Muslims. He could not countenance, quote, such divided loyalties and splitting up of Indian states into so many parts, unquote. It was in such a grim domestic and international scenario that the first AICC session in post-independence India convened from November 15th to 17th. Kripalani resigned as Congress president. Gandhiji had wanted the old socialist Narendra Deva to take his place, but the others chose Rajendra Prasad, who took charge. Addressing the AICC, Gandhiji spoke some home truths. No Muslim in the Indian Union, he told the leaders of the party and government, should feel his life unsafe. During his post-prayer discourse on November 21st, he noted that as many as 137 mosques in Delhi had been damaged, and he regarded all such desecration as a blot upon Hinduism. Noticing a lack of warmth in welcoming Muslims into the Congress, he asked them to serve the party from outside, just as he was doing. On January 12th, 1948, Mahatma Gandhi announced his momentous decision to start an indefinite fast to try and bring about a reunion of hearts among all the communities. His reward would be regaining India's dwindling prestige and her fast fading sovereignty over the heart of Asia and there through the world. As he commenced his fast, when I survey the wondrous cross was sung followed by recitations from the Quran and Guru Granth Sahib and Hindu devotional songs were performed. This was no ordinary fast. It was designed to avert a catastrophe and to assert that no one had a right to say India belonged to only the majority community and the minority community can only remain there as the underdog. Even though Sardar Patel had ceased to be his yes man, as he put it, he did not want him to be singled out for censure and insisted on the cabinet's collective responsibility. On January 15, 1948, the government of India released rupees 55 crores that it had withheld from Pakistan on account of the outbreak of hostilities over Kashmir. It ought to lead to an honorable settlement, not only of the Kashmir question, Gandhi said the next day, but of all the differences between the two dominions friendship should replace the present enmity. However, it was only after receiving an ironclad written declaration signed by leaders of all the major organizations to restore goodwill among communities in Delhi and beyond that Gandhiji broke his fast on January 18th. There had been reports of the RSS fomenting trouble in different parts of the country, including Kathiawar and Rajkot in the Mahatma's own Gujarat. Gandhiji did not fail to remind the representatives of the Hindu Mahasabha and the RSS that they could not be indifferent to violence in places other than Delhi. It would be a fraud upon God, he warned, if they did so. Far away in Lake Success, Pakistan's foreign minister, Zafrullah Khan, informed the UN Security Council that, quote, a new and tremendous feeling and desire for friendship between India and Pakistan was sweeping the subcontinent in response to the fast, unquote. Gandhiji himself was glad to be released from his duty in Delhi and planned to be able to travel to Pakistan. He broke the fast to the chanting and singing of Japanese, Muslim, Parsi, Christian, and Hindu scriptures and hymns and 
the recitation of the ancient mantra, Om Asatoma Sadgamayo, Tamasoma Jyotirgamayo, Mrittorma Amritam Gamayo. Lead me from untruth to truth, from darkness to light, from death to immortality. The final week of the Mahatma's life was rich with symbolism, redolent of India's unity. On January 23rd, 1948, Gandhi was very glad to take note of Shubhasha's birthday, even though he generally did not remember such dates, and quote, the deceased patriot believed in violence, unquote, while he was wedded to nonviolence. Shubhash, according to the Mahatma, knew no provincialism nor communal differences, and had, in his brave army, men and women, drawn from all over India without distinction, and evoked affection and loyalty, which very few have been able to evoke. A lawyer friend requested Gandhiji for a good definition of Hinduism. He did not offer any, but suggested that Hinduism regarded all religions as worthy of all respect. Shubhash Bose, according to him, was such a Hindu. And so, quote, in memory of that great patriot, unquote, he called upon his countrymen to, quote, cleanse their hearts of all communal bitterness." Unquote. On January 26th, which was Independence Day for Gandhi's generation, he said, let us permit ourselves to hope that though geographically and politically India is divided into two, at heart we shall ever be friends and brothers, helping and respecting one another and be one for the outside world. The next day, he was taken inside the Sanctum Sanctorum of Chishti's shrine in Mehrauli, where he was anguished to see the damage to the exquisite marble screens. He had come to make a pilgrimage, not a speech, and he simply urged Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs to never again listen to the voice of Satan and abandon the way of brotherliness and peace. On the morning of January 30th, 1948, Gandhiji did not neglect to do his daily Bengali writing exercise, even though he had other pressing work, such as drafting a new constitution for the Congress. The sound of the shots fired at the Mahatma that evening echoed across the length and breadth of this great land. The last few months of Gandhiji's life and the manner of his death Biyananda wrote, constituted an epic struggle between an all-embracing humanism and sectarian fanaticism. A 17-year-old girl was attending an interregional and intercaste wedding of a Bengali bride and a Malayali groom in Calcutta that evening when she heard the stunning news that Gandhiji had been shot dead. She tried to persuade herself that it must be a rumor. A pall of gloom slowly descended on the gathering, and the guests quietly departed one by one. Returning home, and this is my mother who was 17 then, and now reminisces, reminiscences at, uh, in, at the age of 88. Returning home, she heard the radio playing the song, Shomukhe Shanti Parabar, as the great soul began his journey across the ocean of peace. Sharat Chandra Bose loved English literature and Shakespeare as much as he had hated British rule. On receiving the heart-rending news that the Mahatma was no more, he remarked wistfully, when comes such another? He might have added, if ever another. Thank you. Jai Hind.
you professor you know you have given the the idea which i got from your lecture is what we have been taught in history that gandhi was sort of you know, from the mount batten view of gandhi sort of christ sort of mohammed sort of a man of god coming to earth fulfilling the will of god servant of god and all that thing but there's enough evidence on the other side too for example I'll, I'll, I'll just give me a couple of minutes i'll trace gandhi was the one who who romanced with the communal elements with the ali brothers when jinnah was against it when the entire went mustafa kamal pasha was trying to secularize turkey taking turkey back from that medieval fanaticism gandhi started you know moving around with the khalifa with those ali brothers who wanted to take uh, back who wanted to take the world back to those medieval uh, you know the medieval fanaticism of the medieval ages again if we see he mahatma gandhi was extremely intolerant one views was netaji shubha when shubhas chandra bose was elected president of the congress he refused to cooperate and collaborate with shubhas bose the roots the grains of intolerance was there in his dna again in 1942 when the cabinet mission had come and offered the country independence the cabinet mission offered india independence after the war they said it will be a dominant status it will be a federal fed sort of federation and where all the people can work together and after the war india would be independent jinnah agreed but gandhi said it was a post dated check and he started without uh, consideration the quit india movement which was quite unnecessary in spite of advice being rendered by mr b k s anger that he should accept this mission cabinet mission plan which would lead to the independence of india he refused and that was a cause of partition because the muslim league he he alienated the muslim league when he alienated the muslim league he it came to a point where sohrawardi started that direct action in calcutta and that was the cause of partition and you said of mahatma gandhi's love for bengal Bengal, in reality, had he really loved Bengal from the core of his heart, he would have understood. He would have gone read Sri Ram Krishna, imbibed the ideas of Sri Ram Krishna, and in Sri Ram Krishna we find God is one. Only we call him by different names. That's all. God is one, and it also follows the statement of the Rig Veda: the truth is one. Sages call him by different names. So you know, there's enough evidence, there's enough thing to say that Mahatma Gandhi was, in a way, responsible for partition. He was the cause of partition, and. the cause of partition was extreme violence he said that india he said that he was a he is experienced with truth he said he was a lover of truth he said that india would be partitioned over his dead body but yet as molana azad said that he was the one who moved molana azad was scandalized that in the congress party working committee meeting mahatma gandhi went ahead and forced upon the idea of partition among the party working <laughs> members so you know okay. yeah That's all right. so okay. this is the thing what's you know this other uh, another school of thought so i'd like to i have i hope you have uh, you have acquainted with the school of thought i like to know your comments on this school of thought which i've which i've told you right now uh, very briefly uh, you know gandhi ji had equal respect for all religious faiths and this you can see even in his uh, days in south africa uh, in prison uh, he would read the gita and the bible Uh, and the the quran and he basically had respect for all religions when you refer to the early 1920s this was a period when we did not have a pejorative meaning attached to the term communal or communalism it was simply a descriptive term in those days communalism began to acquire a pejorative connotation as the lesser other of nationalism only from about 1929 onwards gandhi ji did not believe simply in a territorial nationalism he felt that love for the motherland could be combined with an extraterritorial anti-colonial sentiment which is why he made common cause with the ali brothers and it's very hard to describe the ali brothers as communal they were never defined as such in the early 1920s muhammad ali was president of the indian national congress in 1923 and he called for a federation of faiths 
And uh, all that he did was that he sometimes wanted that in Congress resolutions, you might just want to thank God. And Nehru uh, would have you know, quarrels uh, with uh, Muhammad Ali. But then Muhammad Ali would say that actually you have deep spiritual faith. Uh, I'll forgive you, and so forth. So, and, and you know, from 1857-58, or more emphatically from 1877, when Queen Victoria was declared the Empress of India, kaiser e hind there were many Indian Muslims who were forced, following the deportation of the Mughal Emperor, to find another symbol of sovereignty in the Ottoman Sultan Caliph. That was the context in which this, uh, uh, this alliance was forged. Also, we tend to forget that Gandhiji was not alone in forging uh, unity uh, with the Ali brothers and Maulana Azad as well took the same position at that time. If you think about Bal Gangadhar Tilak, you know, who led the Ganapati festivals in Maharashtra, he, in his, the last year of his life, there's a photograph of him blessing the green flag of the Khilafat. That was the basis on which unity had been forged. Yes, Jinnah felt that constitutional methods should still be pursued. He was not in favor of the pro-Khilafat Muslims. There were different points of view that had been expressed. But Gandhi could see that constitutionalism was dead. There was no advance towards India's freedom. He could also see uh, that you know, individual terrorism, isolated acts of violence uh, had run its course. And so he had come forward before the country with a novel method of struggle, non-violent, non-cooperation. So that's the context in which we must see this. But of course, it was in 1924 that Kamal Ataturk abolished the Khilafat, and the larger context changed. You say that in 1939, Gandhiji was intolerant. Yes, he had difficulty in accepting the democratic verdict of the electors, of the president of the Indian National Congress. But I think that we in Bengal exaggerate the differences uh, that emerged between Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose in the year 1939. If there was a parting of the ways, it was a very temporary one. After all, Shubhash Chandra Bose said that it would be a tragedy for him if he had gained the trust of everyone else, but not the trust of Gandhiji, whom he described as India's greatest man. And, um, you will see that from 1942 onwards again, their aims and ideologies converged. Netaji supported the launch of the Quit India movement. I think you are wrong on the facts when you say that the British uh, you know, offered uh, uh, you know, uh, independence. The Crips mission of 1942 offered nothing. Uh, even Jinnah did not accept anything that the Crips uh, mission offered. It was you know, talking about a local option, provinces could be given the right to opt out of a future Indian Union. And it was talking vaguely about dominion status after the war. And I think Mahatma Gandhi was right on the mark in uh, uh, rejecting it as a post-dated check on a bank that was obviously uh, failing. Uh, and so, you know, Shubhash Chandra Bose supported the Quit India movement in his broadcasts from ab abroad. He was the one who then addressed you know, Mahatma Gandhi as father of our nation. And even in 1942, Gandhi was telling Louis Fisher that Shubhash Chandra Bose was a patriot of patriots. And as you will have seen from all of the quotations um, that I have given from Mahatma Gandhi's statements between 1945 and January 1948, each reference to Netaji was nothing short of a eulogy. So that is the relationship between Mahatma Gandhi and Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, characterized by deep love, affection, and mutual respect. Uh, if we have a holistic view of uh, history, you know, that is what we would conclude. And it is simply not true that Maulana Azad, um, you know, um, at the end of the day, stood solidly you know, against uh, partition. I've read all of the proceedings of that period. 
Yes, Gandhiji had said that partition would be over his dead body, and in a sense, that is how it turned out to be eventually. Uh, and uh, there are those, including my grandfather, Sharat Chandra Bose, who had said to him that even if you raise your little finger, partition can be averted. And it's in that context that Gandhiji had said, Sharat, you don't understand. All my yes men have become my no men. So he tried the best to avert the catastrophe, but did not succeed in the conditions of 1947. But actually, within the top echelons of the Congress, Azad kept quiet in June 1947. There were only three other people who stood by Mahatma Gandhi. Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan of the Northwest Frontier Province, who denounced the Congress leadership for throwing the people of the Northwest Frontier Province to the wolves. If the Bengali exception had been accepted, a Northwest Frontier Province exception might have also been uh, available. Uh, the Congress had been in power even after the 1946 elections in the Northwest Frontier Province. So there was Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, there was Jayaprakash Narayan, and there was Ram Manohar Lohia, who later wrote a very fine book talking about the three guilty men of partition, mentioning three other Congress leaders who insisted on partition at that time. And all that I will say is that, in conclusion, is that uh, clearly, Mahatma Gandhi missed his rebellious son, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. I think the saint and the warrior, if they had been able to work together, might have had a far better chance in preventing the tragedy of partition that, uh, that, uh, uh, that the subcontinent had to endure. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. just, just a quick question. You know, you know, uh, before 1947, what Muhammad Jinnah think in the meeting with the Britishes about the partition of India and Pakistan, uh, should their Gandhiji support his uh, opinion? And second question is that, uh, you know, Gandhiji was always against the uh, firing fighting against the Britishes. Therefore, he was a supporter of non-firing fighting, but he was uh, against the Britishes. Uh, should he, he support the uh, fight of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose with uh, Ajat Hind force in this matter? Well, uh, you know, of course, Mahatma Gandhi and Muhammad Ali Jinnah, you know, had their differences. And it was only when the British asked for an alternative demand in 1940 uh, that the Muslim League came forward with the Lahore Resolution. But as many historians have shown, uh, you know, Jinnah was trying to work for an equitable share of power for Muslims, both in the majority provinces and the minority provinces. You know, the kind of partition involving the division of the provinces of Punjab and Bengal that came about uh, w w was not something that, you know, Jinnah was, was after. Uh, at the very least, as you can see, you know, Gandhi and Jinnah were still able to hold fairly, you know, cordial talks, trying to reach something of a settlement as late as, you know, May 1947, as I have, uh, uh, as I have mentioned in the course uh, of my lecture. Gandhiji's uh, view, you know, on violence was quite sophisticated, and nonviolence was quite sophisticated. Nonviolence for him was a philosophy of life. But he had always maintained that he had offered it to the Indian National Congress as a political strategy. Because there was a disarmed population in the country. Any subjugated people must choose the method of resistance based on the circumstances of its servitude. And Indian circumstances, at least in 1919-20, suggested that you know, Gandhi's method of satyagraha was the right one. Now, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose was a participant for two decades in the movements led by Mahatma Gandhi. But he felt that the British had successfully kept the Indian soldiers loyal to the King Emperor when the civilian masses had all rallied to Gandhi, which is why he went abroad and successfully undermined that loyalty and instilled a new loyalty in Indian soldiers to the cause of Indian independence. Mahatma Gandhi always admired courage. He did not like cowardice. So if there was a choice between you know, cowardice and violence, he said he would choose violence. That is why you have these very nuanced remarks even expressing admiration for the revolutionaries who had conducted the Chittagong Armory Raid. And also what is very clear is that 
Gandhiji came to truly admire not just Netaji's bravery, but the way in which he successfully united all of the religious communities and uh, regional uh, linguistic groups of India as no other leader had been able to achieve. That is what he truly admired about Netaji Shuvash Chandra Bose. Uh, There's an elderly gentleman at the back, I don't know. Is there any other question from the floor? Yes. Very simple question, Shivato. Sure. Thank yes. you for a brilliant and so very articulate chapter of history. Uh, this year being 150th year, we are in India especially, I know, all over. Lot of celebrations going on, acknowledging the presence of Gandhi in history and partition. I mean, you are so close to also Bangladesh, I know, and Pakistan. Are they also remembering in Gandhi in the way that we are? Thank you. You know, not quite, perhaps, in the way that we are. But then, um, you know, there are those uh, who are in Bangladesh uh, who are remembering Gandhi uh, in his 150th year. I know that he's being remembered in Noakhali, the place which was the venue of his experiments with truth in late 1946 and 1947. I, th I know that there are individuals and sm small groups uh, in uh, Pakistan who are aware of the history of this period, who are remembering Gandhiji at this time. After all, there are people in Pakistan who know uh, what uh, Zafrullah Khan, the Pakistan foreign minister, said when Mahatma Gandhi launched his you know, final fast. But naturally, I suppose, um, we will be remembering him even more. But then I think it's worth considering, how do we actually remember him? Yesterday, our prime minister said, and I applaud him for that, that we have to uh, honor Mahatma Gandhi on his 150th uh, birth anniversary by rejecting the uh, single-use plastic. And of course, hygiene, you know, cleanliness, uh, uh, environmental protection, these are all values associated with Mahatma Gandhi for which we must remember him this year and also in the future. But at the same time, I think we also need to remember him for the way in which he showed equal respect for members of all religious communities, the way in which he tirelessly worked for unity, but without erasing difference. That is the lesson that, uh, you know, Mahatma, uh, you know, Gandhi, has left us. Won't we remember that sentence of his? I quoted it in a speech that I made on Quit India in 2017, on the 9th of August in Parliament. No Muslim in the Indian Union should feel that his life is unsafe. That is also the Mahatma Gandhi that we should remember and that our government should recognize. So it's all a question of how we remember Mahatma Gandhi, let us, let us not be overly selective and just pigeonhole Gandhi into a, a swach avijan. There is much more to Gandhi, and I would say that in the current situation in our country, far more relevant is the way in which he was applauding Netaji in the last years of his life for uniting all the religious communities of India in a common cause based on equal respect for all of them. I think we should uh, end this evening on that note, Shugatoda. You have uh, you have given us so much to think about, and these questions with with which you you ended the audience engagement, this is, this will be our takeaway. We will, we, we are celebrating 
we are celebrating the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi and we will survive these celebrations, but these will be the real takeaway. Uh, and, and the, the real spirit of Mahatma Gandhi, which you have brought out and which you have explained to us so very evocatively, that's the spirit which will be, I hope, which will be our takeaway from this lesson. Thank you very much for a brilliant, brilliant lecture full of wit, wisdom and humanity. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just on the topic of Mahatma Gandhi, day after tomorrow in this very hall, we have the Viceroy's house being screened at 4.30. And next Wednesday will be Gandhi, my father. So it will go on in the coming weeks. I'm just giving you these two to remember now, that day after tomorrow is the Viceroy's house. And next Wednesday will be Gandhi, my father. So you're all welcome. 4.30, 4.30.